All right, welcome back to the Codex Cantina. I am Una, and today we are going to do another short story from William Faulkner. We are doing Two Soldiers, which uh, there's not a lot of people talking about this one. I think a lot of people kind of poo-poo on it, and uh, I'm not going to come over here and say it's his greatest work ever, but uh, I think it's worth there being a little bit more discussion and literature on it, so hopefully I can bring that to you uh, for those that wanted to talk about Two Soldiers. First, let's get our bearings, because this came out in May of 1942, and you have to remember that December of 1941 was when Pearl Harbor happened. So this was a very relevant story. Some would argue propaganda, but he did write three stories total about the Greer family. To kind of find out what happens with Pete uh, going to war and stuff like that, you'd have to read Shall Never Perish, but that's not in the selected version that I purchased, unfortunately. Maybe I'll go out and get the collected version to kind of uh, wrap that up if you guys want to see more about that. But it's interesting to point out that uh, if we look at some of Faulkner's personal life, he was rejected from joining the army, actually, for being too short. He was five foot five. And I think that's relevant maybe for uh, talking about a story of a little boy not joining the army, right? Or, I mean, obviously he was too short because he was nine, rejected for different reasons. Um, but I think there's some interesting parallels there in terms of probably what Faulkner felt and that he, he could probably more closely identify with the young boy. We know he likes writing from a young boy's perspective. You know, we look at the Reavers. We look at, you know, last week we did Barn Burning. He does a lot of coming-of-age stories. We, he does a lot of stories where boys want to accomplish something, and they do, but then it's still kind of sad. Like, they don't really win when they accomplish it. So we see him kind of continue this theme with, with two soldiers. This is uh, critically controversial because there's a lot of people that panned it and said it's just straight propaganda, that, there's, that, that it's just not interesting. Um, I think I have some interesting points that, when I went to the, the 800s to kind of do some research, I didn't see anyone talking about these. So I, I, I think it'll be interesting discussion when, when you do spend some time to go into these stories. Uh, even if, if it's not universally loved, you can still take a lot out of it. You know, for me, uh, having just finished Barn Burning in, this, in this, this, this book, it continues that concept of a young boy's loyalty, a young boy's uh, respect of the truth. You know, the, the young boy that wants to see the world in a positive light. I do get the feeling that I, I didn't totally believe the characters. Like, some of them were themes, not characters. To, like, totally believe. Believable. So I get I get the criticism, but regardless, uh, Faulkner really likes this story, and there's a reason why it's in this anthology. I have a quote where he says, and I'm going to paraphrase because I'm going to cut out some things here just to get to the point. I like it because it portrays a true American, an independent creature with courage and bottom and heart. So I think this speaks a lot to kind of what we've probably picked up when we've read this story. You know, it's kind of funny. He, he had another quote. So this story has been banned. Um, and some schools actually successfully, when they printed it, got some of like the N word and ended the word hell removed from the story. And he had an interesting quote where he said, uh, this may be good for the children. In fact, it will be teaching them at an early and tender age to be ever on guard to protect and shield their elders and teachers from the, from certain of the simple facts of life. Um, obviously, that's a very sarcastic uh, comment. And, uh, you know, wherever you fall on the intellectual freedom scale, in terms of whether you use things as a teaching moment, or whether you hide some really gruesome things and try to teach them other ways, I'll let you decide there. But I think that quote kind of tells us a little bit more about how Faulkner feels. Obviously, since he drops these words constantly, and they did make it into this version of the book. But if your version didn't have those words, that's why, because there were some versions that had the censorship in them. All right, so in terms of plot, it, it's pretty simple. We have two brothers that go listen to, you know, the radio at a, a neighbor, and they overhear the, the happenings of Pearl Harbor. It starts eating away at the older brother, and eventually the older brother volunteers to go join the army to fight in World War II. We see the impacts this has on his mom, his dad. They both give a very quick and poignant point of view of what their issues are. Um, and we see the young one struggle with what that means since he's always been at his brother's side that he actually goes and tries to chase down his brother 100 miles away. You know, he left home with three items, the knife and the egg being what I thought were some of the two more important ones and our talking points for later on in the story. But basically, he finds his brother, his brother's like, look, you need to protect the land back home, you need to protect the land that my dad gave me. You know, you need to do your part. And the boy is driven home after, and uh, he cries on the way home. So just at a surface level of what's in the text, that's what happens. And I understand that that might not completely satisfy people, whether you know they're looking for a twist or 
um, something more than exploring what is ultimately an unnamed narrator's heart about what it means to lose a connection with his brother. So, so you know, you can have your different feelings on that. That's fine. I want to talk specifically that I didn't see many people talking about the egg. I think it's pronounced shike poke. Whenever an author puts in a specific word like that. So, for example, we talked about in The Gunslinger, why did they choose unleavened bread as opposed to bread or just any other type of bread? Um, there's, there's a specific biblical reference and meaning to, to why he placed that bread in that story. Um, here in this one, why a shike poke egg and what the heck is a shike poke? I wasn't smart enough to know what it is. Um, I guess it's an older term, so some people may know this, or maybe it's more dialect in the South, but apparently that's another term for a green heron. And it comes from the German words scheiße, I think, uh, which is the S word, and uh, poke, I, I don't speak German, I don't know, which apparently means bag. And it comes from the fact that the bird, when it takes off to flee, it'll it'll crap, you know, it'll lighten its load before it takes off. And it also became kind of slang for a coward, you know, someone who craps and takes off, you know, like a deserter from the army, if you will. So if we think about that, that this this bird, the shike poke, kind of became a symbol of a coward running away. And we're talking about an era where the U.S. is getting bombed. And obviously, Faulkner is giving us opinion about what he thinks bravery means and what land means. I think that has a very important relevance to the story, right? So if we think about it, the brother leaves the egg behind. So if the egg represents cowardice, the brother left his cowardice behind, you know, I've got to do it. He had to go to war and he leaves behind some, any of that tibbiness or, or fear that he may have. But what did the, what did the little boy do? He brought the egg and a knife. And at first, you know, he's never drawn the knife in his life. Uh, the knife could be a representation of the army. It could be a representation of bravery. It's, it's kind of that turning point when you pull out the knife or you pull out the gun. That's, that's serious business in a lot of plays and in books. Um, and I think it means the same thing here, because when the boy's trying to buy a ticket to go to uh, Memphis, he tries to hand in the egg. He, he gives it away, the, gives away the cowardice. And when he, when he kind of faces some trouble, he pulls out the knife. And the brother later on says he's never pulled out a knife before. So I think you can kind of view that as a symbolic reference, too, in terms of what it means to give up uh, a part of yourself of, of you know give in to your fear even and join the army for the for the sake of the land and i think that's further compounded when we uh see the talk when pete talked to his parents right his mom said well as long as you're not bothering my family the 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 japanese can have the land if they want his dad said something to the effect basically of uh so long as we're not being invaded um, and then there's some very specific references to land at that point in time so his father associates land as what he needs to protect, and the mom kind of associates family, I think, as what she needs to protect. It's kind of what he's going at there. So right then, Pete got 10 acres, right? So he gives it back to his family, and that's what his excuse, is, that's what his lever is when he's talking to his younger brother of, you need to protect that land. The land is what you need to protect. And, and I think that's kind of the other parallel that you have here is what does land mean and what does it mean to protect? So anyways, uh, jumping back to the boy. So when he does go to the army and he finally reaches there in Memphis after facing you know the first knife pulling out, what happens again? He pulls the knife out again. They don't immediately say, you're too young. Right? I was kind of expecting them to say that because the boy's nine, which I think is interesting given that's what Faulkner's reasoning for being turned down from the army was originally. Again, I think we see some of those things about the author coming out in the story there. Um, and I think he's kind of projecting onto, onto these characters, his view of bravery, his view of what you're protecting the land and his view of what you need to give up in order to do that is represented in the egg, the knife, and in the land that's being given to, to Pete. And I think that's probably why there's a lot of criticism on this and why some people kind of write it off because it is very propaganda, very blatant what these points are. You know, the young boy, he's not so much a character so much as a theme as to what he's trying to, to communicate. And that's okay if that's how you feel. I just think that when he uses the egg and the knife as backdrops, to kind of talk about the greater issues at that time was a very, very poignant and beautiful way to, to bring it out. Regardless of how on the nose the other parts of the story are, I think the hidden elements are a lot more beautiful than the stuff on the surface. It's also worth noticing that the characters, well, Pete, when he's kind of, when, when they're hearing the radio in the beginning, Pete is nervous. 
he's distant from his brother. And what happens when, when a character becomes distant in some of Faulkner's writing? What happened last week in Barn Burning when we saw how the father was distant? They were described as metallic. So we have the description of Pete. Pete come back and he got into bed again and laid again still and hard as iron on his back. And then he said, and he wasn't talking to me, he wasn't talking to nobody. So we had the usage as hard as iron as he laid on his back there. And then earlier in the story, we had the narrator say, anyway, he was listening to me now. He wasn't like iron now. So opening up and talking to him, he wasn't like iron as in the distant one. So I think we have seen a couple of the examples where Faulkner likes to use metal as a way of describing a character's state emotionally. Like he's not saying they're hard as iron or hard as metal. He's, he's literally saying that they're, they're distant like a, a metal was. Um, so I think that'll be an interesting thing to keep in mind as we go through some more of Faulkner's works, how often he will use that to describe the character. To me, it's so beautiful when an author pushes himself to try different things, and I think Faulkner um, does some wonderful things here. I didn't think that there were a ton of great quotes in this piece. I actually didn't have any quotes to really share that weren't just kind of some of the dialogue things that push the plot along. But for example, like A Rose for Emily, I'm still trying to decide if we're going to do that next week. There are so many quotes in that that are just gorgeous. Whether you enjoy Faulkner's write, writing or not, you can look at that quote and be like, that's a good quote. So I guess l let me open it up to you guys. If you think we should do a Rose for Emily or if you'd want to do some more of the obscure Faulkner pieces where maybe we can bring some more analysis into this that isn't in the 800s or hasn't been talked to death, uh, let me know and uh, you know we'll keep the discussion going. Um, I'm also looking at doing maybe some Vonnegut if that's something that you guys are interested in. Um, I'm a huge fan of Vonnegut as well as Faulkner. They're, they're, they're two of my favorite writers. So yeah, just let me know what you guys are looking for and what your guys' thoughts are. What did you take away from the story? You know, did, did you get past the patriotism or was it too much? I don't know. I was able to get past it. I'm going to give it a six out of 10. And uh, I think you should check it out if you guys have the time. I think it's a great addition to the work. And I think there's a reason why Faulkner selected it. So all right, guys, happy reading.